can't remember if my fabric is 45 inches wide or 60 inches wide. So I'm going to measure it. Uh, oh. Okay, so to that line is 29. So this fabric is 60 inches wide. And for me, I am supposed to have both of my selvages on one side with a fold on the other. So I had to refold my fabric. It was folded incorrectly. I went crazy. I'll put a link to uh, this purchase off of Amazon in the description box below this video. Three, probably three and a half yards of fabric here. Maybe four yards. And this is the proper folding for me to cut out my, fat, my pattern pieces. We are supposed to have selvages up here. Both of them. And the fold back here. Now I recommend that you find a place where you can just lay your fabric out, pin your pattern pieces down and cut them out. I used to be able to do it on the floor. I no longer can. And my dining room table is just covered with pumpkins right now. So I'm going to try to put George, my sewing machine on the floor, which will give me a little bit more room here. And I can just cut one piece out at a time, which I've done over and over you know as I as I have to so that's what I'm gonna do I'm gonna set it up so that I can do that now we need to figure out which pattern piece will go first and for me it looks like it's going to be piece nine Piece 10, and piece 3. Where's piece 2? There it is. Okay. So we're going to just push these over here out of my way. And so this is a raw edge right here. So this right here is the unchanged little square or rectangle right there. That means that if we're looking at our pattern and that's what we see, like right here, this right here is the right side of the pattern. So for me, that's what I'm supposed to do, have the right side up. And by right side, they mean you can read all of the information on your pattern, it's face up. So we're going to pin and it is supposed to be on the fold. Your pattern piece tells you that right here. It says center back on fold and that always means that this line right here will be on the fold of your fabric I have to pull this up just a wee bit okay Now, if you are looking at this, let me pull down so you can see what I'm talking about. Right here, sometimes when you buy your fabric cut from the fabric store, this cut right here isn't even. And if you put your pattern piece all the way up to the top on a folded piece of fabric, you may discover as you're cutting it out that this has been cut wonky 
and you're only getting one layer of fabric. In other words, this could be shift this down and that might be what it looks like right there and therefore you've only got all of your pattern on one layer of fabric. So check that, uh, make sure on every cut that you are getting all of the pattern cut all the way through on both layers or if there is a problem just slide your pattern down just a little little bit. Now I do have pattern weights but I generally only use them when I'm cutting one pattern piece out at a time. The next step, for me anyway, is to mark my pattern. I want it marked. So if you have a heat erase pen, they're really, really good for marking a solid fabric. Occasionally the ink will get lost on a print. It's hard to see. So if you need to mark with a piece of chalk, there are all sorts of chalk pencils. Um, there's Taylor's chalk. You can take, I'll just trace. Let's see if that'll show up. Since I can see it, there we go, it's right there. So you can just use this, depending on how dark your fabric is. Taylor's chalk, this water soluble marking pencil. There's all sorts of marking utensils out there that are either water soluble, heat erasable, um, you can actually just erase some inks, you can use just plain chalk, uh, be careful with chalk, make sure that if you're using chalk you're marking it on the wrong side of your fabric uh, and when I say chalk I mean just plain chalk like go to the store and buy a piece of chalk. Taylor's chalk is a different story altogether. Let me go grab a piece. So they've made Taylor's chalk, and this is basically butterfly uh, brand, but they've made it in like several colors. And I think these are the traditional Taylor's butterfly chalk that I happen to like. So you could easily mark on almost any solid color fabric with these colors. They are easy to manipulate. I don't know why I'm having such a hard time. Let me get it where you can see it again. It's a camera this time. Okay, so here is white. Here's yellow. Here's blue, which even shows up on blue. And here is maroon or salmon. They're all very visible on this fabric because this is a very deep hued, heavily dyed fabric. They would all work very well on say a denim or chambray. And then they just kind of brush out as you work with your fabric. Eventually these just disappear. So um, if you need to make marks, um, this, like I said, this works really well on just a good solid color cotton, natural fiber fabric. And I've had this box for, my gosh, years, decades. So there's that. But I like to use these. I can get this ink to go through two layers of a cotton fabric. So if I wanted to mark, say, this one right here with this, which I don't, but just for the sake of showing you, let's just say I needed to do that on both sides. 
if I just hold it in a couple of places, the ink will go through. I just realized it's going to be really hard to show that, but I'll just do it up here at the top. <laughs> up at the top. Okay. So I need this line right here to go through all the way through this layer to the other side and then down through the second layer and through the other side. So what I do is I just mark it on here and then I'll lift up my fabric and I can see that it has gone through here and it has gone through just a little bit on this side so I can continue to mark and then flip it over and there it is shadowing through and I'll just finish marking. So now I have that mark in the same place on all four pieces, so to speak, of my pattern. And that's kind of why I like to use these pens, plus the ink just comes right out. Now I don't like to mark, um, you know, into my pattern because there is a shadow effect with this type of ink. It has to have a regular gel ink to bind to. The invisible ink does not work by itself. It has to have a color. Otherwise, when you marked with it, you wouldn't see anything. So, when I say invisible, I mean it erases to invisibility. So, once this has been applied to a fabric and you erase it with the heat or even with the eraser, which the friction from the eraser is what causes this to disappear. There, if it gets cold, if you put this in the freezer, uh, you're going to see a white tracing, and that would be the gel ink that this particular ink was bound to in order to flow through and make a mark on a piece of paper or fabric. Okay, so the next thing I need to check is I have a circle that I need to mark right here. And I usually just hold my pen. I'm not gonna draw an actual circle. I don't feel like I need to. But I'm just gonna hold my pen and when I get this cut out, I will flip it over and check to see that that mark went all the way through. It should. my little mark but I'm going to make it bigger right there okay there's that little mark but I'm going to make it bigger just like that okay now we're just going to leave these pattern pieces pinned easy for me to say the reason for that is I need to make sure at the end that everything I want marked has been marked, that I haven't missed anything. And putting a pattern piece back on in the exact same place, if you've made one mark, after that it's, it's almost impossible to get this pattern piece to get back onto this piece of fabric in exactly the same spot in all of the places. So I'm just gonna leave them on. I'm not gonna worry about taking them off just yet. I have plenty of pins. That's maybe the third number three thing that you need to make sure you have would be, uh, I guess I need to start that whole list over again because the number one thing is an iron. The number two thing, of course, would be a sewing machine. But before you get anywhere near an iron and a sewing machine, you have to have a very sharp pair of scissors. So for me, in order of what is the most important thing, if you're going to start sewing anything, I would say 
scissors and pins are on the same level. You can then add clips. So sharp scissors, a lot of pins. I like to use um, glass head or crystal head because they will not melt, which makes them kind of a dual purpose pin. If I've, if I've only purchased plastic pins, I can't really go to the ironing board and use pins to hold something that I need to press because my pins will melt. But if I have crystal head or glass head pins, I'm in good shape. All right, so scissors, pins, iron, sewing machine, and clips. If you are not able to um, use, get, purchase, find, buy, uh, actual stitching clips, the type that I use, a knockoff of Wonder Clips that I found on Amazon. They're really cute. They came in a little metal tin with a bunny on it. Um, they look and feel and act just like Wonder Clips, but they are not Wonder Clips. I would highly recommend them. They were not very expensive. They have a good grip. They are flat on the bottom like they're supposed to be. And they have the little space in the middle so that you can put your fabric in there. I'm trying to get it where you guys can see. Maybe a darker clip would work. How about this red one? Or pink one or whatever. I don't know. Anyway, there's, there we go. There's a flat plastic bottom and then there's that little humpy on top and that allows for the fabric to fit. If you're not able to procure those, black binder clips work just as well. They're perfectly fine. Okay, so I'm gonna set this one aside over there on the ironing board. And we're going to work on the three other pieces. What happens is the instructions as you're sewing will tell you right or left. So it'll say, mark the buttonholes on the right and the buttons on the left. And then you're left wondering, do they mean my left? Which would, buttonholes would then be on this side? Or do they mean my right when buttonholes would be on this side? So you kind of have to determine what they're talking about and there's a really easy way to figure it out. So let's just quickly take a look at that. If you're not sure, of course, you can look at one of your shirts and you can, you can actually decide if you want the buttonholes to be on the other side if you prefer that. But for traditional women's whoops, shirts, buttonholes will go on Oh, I think that is on this side, on the right. Okay, make the buttonholes in the right front shirt band and collar at the markings and then sew the buttons to the left front shirt band and collar at the markings. So if you look at this, we're facing the guide drawing, right? We're facing this. So this is showing buttons on this side, which is clearly on my right. But if I turn this around and look at it this way, now the buttonholes are on the, or excuse me, the buttons are on the proper left side and the buttonholes are on the proper right side. So that's another way that you can do it. You can just hold it up to yourself and say, wait a minute, okay. It can be confusing. I don't want you to be disappointed. 
and accidentally make one buttonhole on the wrong side and then or the side that you don't prefer and then have to either redo that whole thing or change it or just live with it however you know it ends up being for you so just be really careful that's really about the only thing that requires a tremendous amount of care when we get to that point i'm going to show you some tips on how to avoid making that mistake So I'm going to do a little bit of marking this. I don't think I marked this down here. I believe I do mark. It does take patience to mark your patterns properly and carefully. And if you're in a situation where you really just need to get the pieces cut, you can't, for example, you're using your dining room table and you just, you know, you can't uh, leave things laying around. Just cut them out and mark them when you have time. It's just not a good idea to rush through this phase of the project. You really don't want to do that. All right, so we're gonna cut this out. Let's just see. Now sometimes pieces like this will be on the other side of a piece like this and I don't want to waste this little chunk of fabric that I've got right here. So I am going to go ahead and take, I, would, I wouldn't use this for anything else. So I'm going to go ahead and just take advantage of it and put piece number nine. And before I go any further, there's a couple of other things that I want to talk about regarding pattern pieces. You are going to see on your pattern piece information underneath the number. So right here I have piece number three, front band A, B, C, D, and then the other language. And then down here it's going to say fabric, cut two. Voila, I know I have to cut two of these. That's why my fabric is folded. Then down here is going to say interfacing cut two. There again, I know I'm going to have to put this on some interfacing and cut two pieces. Note that when I cut my interfacing, I don't need interfacing in the seam allowance of this. So I'm going to cut it slightly smaller I'm not going to cut it all the way to the ends, and I'm not going to cut it all the way to the sides. And that interfacing is there to help with the stability due to the fact that these two pieces require a buttonhole and a button. You don't want, you know, floppy fabric. You need fabric that is stable with some interfacing. Okay. The same thing is true on this one. It says to cut two from the fabric. There is nothing here about interfacing, and I do have two markings, but I'm going to mark it after I get it cut out. Okay, piece number 10, and I keep looking to make sure this is put on my fabric in the proper way. So far, I'm doing just fine. Everything, all of my pattern pieces are face up. I don't have to flip any over to cut them out this way.
you could do it. Okay, so we have piece 10 that's also been done. And so if you look at this, this is the cuff for the sleeve. And these are where your buttons will be placed, these little X's. So you just have to decide. And then over here, on this side, is the buttonhole. And that's another slightly confusing piece. You have to decide which piece of your sleeve has the buttonhole. And on this shirt, the buttonhole is here, and the button is here. And on this side, the buttonhole is here, and the button is here. So on the outside, the buttonhole will be placed, and on the inside of the sleeve, the button will be placed. Whoa, that's going to go on the floor. Okay. So next, we will be looking at piece number one. And this is the sleeve, which has a lot of fullness. This is our collar. Piece number one will go over here. I do not want to use the selvages. They show the uh, piece number one is just right up next to the, the selvage on the front piece of fabric. I'm not going to do that. I think it's okay sometimes to do it. However, the fabric gets tighter and tighter and tighter. The weave just gets really tight as you approach the selvage. And I don't want it when I wash this shirt, I don't want that to shrink more or the shirt to shrink less and have a pucker on my front placket. Now, the selvage that gets where it starts to get tighter and tighter isn't on the dots. It's beyond, it's out in the fabric and you can feel it with your finger just as easily as anything. This right here, where are my pieces of chalk? There they are. And once again, I have my grain line and my little arrow is right here. So as you see, the fabric here is folded and the instructions for the collar are to line up this center back line right here with your fabric piece facing up like so. Don't be tempted to fold it in half because you may make a mistake and accidentally cut through it. So we're going to line it up on the fold. Like 
so. And we will have to do this twice because this clearly will just be one collar and we need to cut two. So I'm gonna keep my little pins outside. These pins are shorter than my crystal head pins. These are just your basic clover white glass head pins. Yes. All right, so I need to follow this line right here. So I'm gonna trace that because I don't want to damage all the rest of the lines. Let me show you what you can do if you forget to um, cut your notch like I just did right here. Just snip in by a very tiny amount. Just make a little snip into your fabric like that. It'll still be within the seam allowance and you should be just fine. button, buttonhole. So the buttonhole would be on this side and the button will be on the other side. So if this is just one collar piece, this opens out and it goes around. This is going to be the side with the buttonhole right here. And this one on this side is going to be the hole with the button. But I can't cut the same piece twice. So this piece right here has little teeny tiny dots that you may or may not be able to see. That means that we have to flip our pattern piece over so that it is face down. And that key is on the front. Yes. So right here with the little teeny tiny dots it says wrong side of pattern. So we have to turn it over but it still has to face the same direction. I cut the first one with the pattern piece right side up, and now I'm going to cut this one with the pattern piece wrong side up. I'm also going to allow the rest of the heavy fabric to fall <laughs> to the floor. All right. So this time I'm going to flip this over. The pattern is supposed to be placed this way. If I turned it over and tried to do this side again, it would be facing in the opposite direction, which is wrong.
Now I want to keep these two with the pattern. That's another thing that's important. So I don't want to poke a hole with a, a big pin hole, so I'm going to clip this. That's something I do a lot, is try to avoid making a hole in my fabric. My pins are pretty thin and don't do that, but you could end up with an issue if you're not careful. And the last pattern piece for my version is the sleeve. As you can see, I still just have heaps and gobs of fabric. So here's the two sleeves that I will leave on the pattern pieces to mark. <laughs> 